lighting. Um, like I said, guys, we um, for lighting we have visual uh, Lithonia visual software that we did all the lighting calculation. This chapter, Adam talks a little bit about more lamps and uh, and the fixtures. So it's going to be repeating some of the stuff that we guys said in uh, our lighting book that we have. Um, the focus on this one really <clears throat> that I thought it's interesting is the ballast. There's a um, kind of a, a little bit more information about ballasted lights. And um, and Karen, like we said before, when you guys have lights, there's a major major categories of lights. The main category of lights is either arc fixture, a fixture that creates light via arc, like these one above your head. You make an arc and you convert this um, UV type of light into visible light. They call them the arc fixtures, fluorescent and high intensity discharge, or non-arc fixtures. And non-arc fixtures, guys, you get you the incandescent lights and LEDs. LEDs also a non-arc fixture. So these guys, they just burn certain things and they created light by glowing. So let's talk a little bit, guys, about a few terminology that they use with the, with the lighting. Technical terms associated with the lamps and the ballasted, like rapid start, preheat start, instant start. You'll hear all the people talking when you go to the industry mat. They will be talking about what type of ballast we're going to specify. Instant start ballast. Okay, so rapid start, preheat start. Preheat start is gone. They don't use it anymore. So there's a few um, a few th things about the ballast. Um, lamp schedule in a commercial building. That's they have, we have, they have schedule like you do guys in that book, and they they use different type of lights. You guys have done it with me. So basic. Uh, type of lights, like I said, the non-arc type of lights is incandescent. Throw this one outside the window in terms of general lighting in a commercial industrial building. Halogen is um, a treated incandescent lamps. They treat the incandescent lamps and put some uh, chemicals in it, gases to make it more efficient. So it's still not a whole lot of use in the, in the jet for general lighting. Now remember, guys, some of these lights are used. Like low voltage or high voltage, they're used in equipment. You open your fridge, what happened? The light comes on. That's not the light that we're talking about. We're talking about general lights, lights that illuminate general areas. Um, fluorescent lights, guys, LEDs, and high intensity discharge. These ones are the most common three types of lighting fixtures. And we talked about these one. And LEDs are taking over. LEDs taking over indoor and outdoor lights now. Next, our next project, like I told you guys, will be a complete LED lights, parking lot, parameter lights, as well as indoor. So that's the future. Um, if you don't want to spend the money for LEDs, you, we only have two options. In a, in a, well, mostly two options. Fluorescent lights indoor, and if you're outdoor, guys, what they do, uh, fluorescent lights indoor and outdoor, they're using high intensity discharge, metal halide or high pressure sodium. See, really, that's the most, unless you want to go to the LED option. Um, Electronic um, and, and magnetic ballast. We'll talk a little bit, guys, about, about the electronic and, and, uh, and magnetic ballast. And why do arc, every time you create an arc, you need to have something called the ballast. And very simple, for the most part, guys, the ballast pumped the voltage so high to start the arc. And when the arc started, it reduced the current to an acceptable level so the circuit breaker does not trip to maintain the arc. Very simple. Pump the voltage high, start the arc, reduce the current, choke the current down to a level where the circuit breaker doesn't trip to maintain the arc, which means you are maintaining that lighting picture that you're looking at. So these are the things that we're going to talk about. Um, a practical application of lamp using the commercial bu uh, building. This is just for the project that they're using. Um, and we talked about their schedules and where they're using it. Energy saving ballast, this, this is a big deal. Next week, um, Karen, we're going to be, I'm going to be introducing you guys to uh, ComCheck, a software called ComCheck, where you're going to be putting all your uh, lighting fixtures in that ComCheck and use ASHRAE 90.1 uh, 2012, we're going to use, Minnesota's 2004, and we're going to run energy code analysis on the fixtures that we did. Are they going to meet the energy code or not? Um, with the energy code comes, that's for the lamp, for the lamps, that's for the lamps. 
Now for the ballast guys, in order to use any ballast now in a commercial building, it has to have, meet the energy code requirement, meaning it has to be very efficient ballast. Um, because they have to be very efficient ballast, you're going to kiss goodbye the electromagnetic ballast for the most part, unless you have a specific application for them. Um, lamps, the different type of lamps, guys, have different type of characteristics and letter, letter designation that they go with. So they use an A and a B and a C, and that will give you the shape uh, of that lamps uh, and what's not an a T. Um, and of course, when you dispose, if you're environmentally friendly, Adam, like my my wife, rightfully so, uh, when you dispose all these um, lighting fixtures as a, an engineer. So if you guys, if you, Mishat Kuli wants to come and remodel this floor for Dunway, we need to dispose all these lamps, right? So you have to take into consideration as an electrical contractor, electrical engineer, that there has to be a certain budget for disposal of all these um, uh, ballasts because they have chemicals on them as, and electronics as well as the lamps because they have mercury. So that's, you have to take this into consideration, the hazard associated with disposing all and remodeled ballast lamps and ballast. Any comments, guys, any questions? So that's basically what the major part that we're gonna be talking about. Comments, questions, ladies and gentlemen, any comments, any questions? So let's talk about, let's start from the beginning. From the beginning, guys, there is the smarter than Chad years ago discovered the candela. We talked about the candela, guys. You, you've used it in the formulas that we did. Like here's how they define the candela. Candela is the luminous intensity uh, of a source when expressed in candelas. So how much light, basically the quantity, we measure currency in the US in dollars. Uh, the light is measured in lumens. <laughs> that's, that's all. How much lumens come out of a fixture, how much light, <coughs> Camera fixture is how many lumens come out of that particular picture. <coughs> this is how they define it, guys. The smarter than Chad. It's the amount of light received um, in a unit of time. Look at that. On a unit of area uh, at a unit of distance from a point. Okay, so what does that mean? Look at this. Uh, very easy. Here is my point of light right here. So when you put a source, a point, uh, a, a point light source here, a unit of distance. So move away. Here's the, uh, the spot of light. Move a foot away from it, guys. That a unit of distance. Move a square feet, an area of a square foot. That's a unit of area. For a second, that's a unit of time. They define it as a candela. So the amount of light that come, come, come out of a source uh, at a unit of distance, a unit of, to hit a unit of area during a unit of time. They call it the, the lumens. And they use a sphere to describe this one. So you don't have to get it. If you, get, if you become licensed um, lighting designer, guys, you get into deeper into the science and how they calculate it and what's not. Okay, now we got that lumens coming out of a fixture. When they hit the ground, we call them illuminance. Or when they hit the surface that you want to let. If that light is, it's a star's light sitting up there, and we care less about it, just lumens, right? The minute it hits the area that we need to let, we convert the term from lumens, we start calling it what? Foot candles. So foot candles is called the measurement of illuminance. It's lumens per unit area. You guys have done it. So if you take the lumens, uh, you did it with me by divided by area. And we do have formulas for this. We worked on it on the lighting book. Um, that becomes foot candle. If you're in, in, if you're in the US, we call it foot candle. Now, if you divide this one by feet, by square foot, um, by square foot, this becomes a foot candle. If you divide this by square meter, they call it what? Lux. Mr. Lux. It becomes a Lux. So typically in Europe, they don't use foot candle. They use Lux. Okay? So if you're hearing the Lux, make sure that they're using a metric system. It's a metric system designation. Any comments, guys, about the luminance? So that's new to you. Remember the Lux, though. If you see a Lux, so what the heck is a Lux, Chad? That's just a luminance divided by a square meter <coughs> instead of a square foot. <coughs> Okay, because of the energy code, 
and rightfully so, Brian, because we're becoming environmentally friendly and we don't want to depend on foreign oil, even the olive oil from Chad's farm in the Middle East too. We don't want to depend on that. Um, that's politically correct, huh? Um, so we need to we need all our lamps to be very efficient. The most efficient lamp right now, guys, is what LEDs. I mean, it goes without discussion. <coughs> how many lumens you can get out of every watt will decide how efficient this fixture is, how good and how, would it meet the energy code or not. So lumens per watt, very very important. Efficiency of the motor, um, efficiency of the lamps. Now, Adam, you're going to be doing this next week when you guys do the energy code. It will give you the lumens per watt for the whole, how many lumens per watt for the whole building. Um, um, measure of, if it, if it's measure of it, well, effectiveness of the fixture. They also call it efficacy. Efficacy is like efficiency, except if the units are different, they call it efficacy. If the units are the same, it's called efficiency. For example, kilowatt over kilowatt for motors, <coughs> efficiency. Miles per hour miles per hour that's efficacy right how many miles per hour or um or miles per per, per gallon mi miles per gallon actually miles per gallon. miles per gallon that's efficacy how many miles your car can drive per gallon 25 miles or 50 miles that's efficacy we know it's the same term the same concept it's how the effectiveness of the system except if the units are the same efficacy efficiency if the units are different efficacy <coughs> Okay, so that's um, how effective the light is, how efficient the light is, how many lumens can come out pure what? Then Mr. Kelvin jumps in. Mr. Kelvin, guys, uh, we measure the temperature you guys are familiar with, Fahrenheit in the U.S. In most of the world, they use uh, the Celsius, right? And the zero Fahrenheit, the zero Celsius is equivalent to what? 32 Fahrenheit, right? Zero Celsius. Is equivalent to 32 Fahrenheit. When you hit 32, that's zero Celsius. Okay. Now, the scientific community, Adam, create their own temperature rating. It's called the Kelvin. So their zero <coughs> start at this value. So the zero um, is equivalent to 200 zero Celsius. Is equivalent to 273.16 Kelvin. Another temperature measuring used almost exclusively for scientific application. And they have their own reason to do that. So equivalent to a degree value in Celsius. Um, so the zero Celsius will be equivalent to, to in Fahrenheit, the zero Fahrenheit is equivalent to 32 degree Fahrenheit, right? So you can see the comparison. That's Celsius. That's Celsius. Okay. Who cares? The question, who cares? When, you talk, when we talk about lambs, guys, they give him a Kelvin temperature rating for the lamps, temperature rating for the lamps. And that will decide if the lamp is going to be more reddish, lower temperature, or more bluish, higher temperature. Who cares? If you put somebody like my wife in a room like this, I hope she's not listening to that presentation, and she gets moody under certain light. And a lot of people are. I mean, uh, me too included. So if you put too much bright uh, light, right? Sharp, bright light, bluish light. It drives people nuts. They want the warm, right? That warm, um, uh, reddish type of light. It makes certain people feel better. So, the temperature of the light, guys, the lamp itself will um, will decide the mood of the people. So, if you change these right now into 5,000 5, kelvins, it drives a lot of people nuts. And of course, I I showed you the extreme. The very, very reddish into the very bluish, and in between you get into the white and soft, and soft white, and what's not all the way in between. So that's going to be a big, big deal, big concept. I'll show you that one in a second. There's also a concept, guys, uh, called color rendering index. Color rendering index is the ability of the lamp to betray the object as normally as possible, meaning a black or a red or a blue. Um, will look uh, black, red, or blue. So it distinguish between colors, sharp distinction between colors. The higher the color rendering index, Karen, like we said in other um, uh, uh, other presentation, the higher the color rendering index, the better the fixture is. Why? Because when you go outside in the parking lot, you can find your, your green car um, or blue car. You don't have to look, is this green or blue or black, right? 
So if the car has, a, if the if the fixture has a lower color entering index, guys, it mixes certain colors, especially the green and the blue and the black. They they mix they mix together. So it will be hard to find certain colors at night in a parking lot. Okay, so that's color entering index. Or so if you're going to buy your favorite um, uh, shirt, don't you think they want to have a higher color like? Uh, uh, merchandise and all the stuff they want to have the highest color running index fixture that they can do because it shows the exact color of the objects um, and probably Karen in the theaters they use them a lot to start to, to manipulate the color and, and what's not so it's a ma major major part okay so that's uh, pay a lot of attention to this one higher means better for a lot of application um, lumen maintenance uh, lumen depreciation factor, you guys, we talked about this one, is how long does the lab maintain its lumens? When you say 3,000 lab, 3,000 um, uh, 3, lumens, how long will it take that fixture to maintain the 3,000? Would it stay 3,000 for 24,000 hours? Or would it dip after 24,000 hours or before 24,000 hours? The longer the maintenance, it's like output. Ambient temperature. Ambient temperatures is a major part, guys. The surrounding temperature affects the function. There are certain fluorescent lights will not work in Minnesota in outdoor with because we had uh, 25 below, right? And these fixtures will not, or ballast will not fire under these, uh, flor especially fluorescent. So you have to have a special type of ballast that allow these, if they are outdoor again, or if you put them in a freezer. <coughs> so, um, so the temperature rating or the ambient temperature will affect the performance of these um these fixtures so that's what i wanted to to mention here uh, let me go before we get into the incandescent lamps guys um and just show you the okay where am I here, Chad? okay we talked about the the unit guys and how they define the lumen here's the kelvin can you, I don't know if you guys can see the higher the Kelvin. Can everybody see that? The higher the Kelvin, the higher the Kelvin. The, what what color do you start seeing here? Um, and do you see how it starts becoming very bluish? Have you guys seen the torch when uh, when the, when you when you energize a torch and it's very very hot? Have you ever seen it? Have you ever welded? Anybody welded? When you if you look at the welder, yeah, you've seen it becomes what almost blue very very hot when it becomes very very hot it turns into blue believe it or not it's kind of counterintuitive you think it becomes very red right because red to us is very hot but it really the higher the temperature the more bluish it becomes the lower the temperature look what happened the lower the temperature the more reddish so if you have high kelvin fixture guys for example if your fixture is sitting right here at uh, 5,500 uh, Kelvin, you're, you are looking at bluish light coming out of this fixture. If your fixture is sitting at three, this one, for example, 3,000 uh, Kelvin, you're looking at more orangish, and you keep going all the way. And they give you guys, here's high pressure sodium. Look at the high pressure sodium. Uh, give you right in the orange area. Um, standard incandescent lamps put you in this area, halogen, uh, white metal halide, uh, standard clear metal halide, they put you in this area. Uh, cool white fluorescent, look how cool white fluorescent put you in this area. Daylight metal halide give you in, kind of put you in these areas in terms of color. Who cares, guys? It will make you feel different um, or better or, or not, depending on the type of the light. Any comments, guys? Any questions about the Kelvin? So you have you you will have a three a three thousand Kelvin or a five thousand Kelvin light, lighting fixture. If you want a five thousand Kelvin um, lamps right here, it, 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 you know when you when you look at it, it's very bright. You know, it looks very very bright compared to the three thousand Kelvin. You know, uh, more in the almost on the uh, bluish. Um, if you want soft. Um, uh, cool white and soft cool white and what's not so you start you start dealing with the soft cool uh, cool white right here and soft cool white get you into the, the um you know into more or less into the yellow the white or all the way to the to the red of course can you guys see the spectrum where the kelvin plays a big role into how the fixture will will uh, will send the the color if that makes sense 
Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you that that before we move into the incandescent lamps, <coughs> the least favorite of mine. Okay, incandescent lamps, guys. You all know that uh, you can't you can't use it and meet the energy code. So kiss this one goodbye in terms of commercial industrial buildings, right? Low efficacy, bad. Um, doesn't have doesn't give you a whole lot. Um, believe it or not, based on this book, and I believe it's right based on what I see. It's still 50%, over 50% of the lamps sold in the U.S. are incandescent lamps, right? Because a lot of residential people, they're cheap, they can buy them. Um, so very low efficacy, low cost, cheap, but there are federal uh, regulation guys that prohibit them from being used in commercial. See the word in commercial application and i believe there were regulations to stop producing all them all of them together i don't know if it went through or not um okay so that's basically there's also what they do then uh, halogen they add use of halogen and other type of uh, uh, of, of, of um, gases guys they add to them in that bulb they put some halogen and it makes it brighter so they still have a lot of application for them like in car industry and what's not, but in the general lighting industry, you you almost non-existence. Uh, how do they make them? You guys are very familiar with them. They have the filament, they radiate heat. You put a, a heater and you put a voltage across it, it glows, it cooks the electricity, it glows and makes the light. That's what as simple as, simple as that. Little heater, uh, the filament they call it. And you put the filament in an envelope, which is the glass envelope, the bulb, and fill it with um, a, a, a gas to make it work properly, and have a lead wire so you connect to it, and then have a base so you can connect that heater into the electricity. I don't know if we have the, here you go, very simple, very easy. It can't be easier than that, right? You bring your power in here, burn it right here, bring it back. Here's my 120 volt power. And you put some type of a gas inside it to make it perf per to perform a little bit better. Any comments, guys? Any questions about the incandescent lamps? Like I said, kiss it goodbye in terms of general lighting in a commercial building. Uh, characteristics, guys. There's a lot of voltages. You can get them into into different voltages, different watts, uh, different shapes, different sizes. Operation hours, a thousand or so. They're they're really bad for operation different uh, catalog designation in terms of shapes and they can come guys at low voltage 12 volts or 6 volts or 24 volts you see them a lot in refrigerators and other applications other than buildings so they will continue to exist in other applications they have their own um uh, uh, own application where they can make make sense um there's also low voltage incandescent lamps, guys. Those guys burn on uh, on 24 volts and, and 6 volts. <clears throat> um, they also have their own designations of catalog designations. So the the last thing you want to do, you want to have a socket of 24 volt that fits that fits into 120. Immediately, it will burn that fixture, right? So um, okay, so that's the fluorescent light. Let me talk, show you a couple of things, guys, about. Um, a couple of pictures about that one too um for fluorescent light guys i'm sorry for uh, incandescent lights it's the output of it is directly proportional to the look at this this is the curve of the light curve this is the lumen curve if you have an atom if you have an incandescent lamp the more voltage you put across that baby the more lumen you can get out of it to a point though and the more voltage, more that it's rated for, the more voltage you can get across it, the lower the ex life expectancy would be. So the, the ultimate goal, of course, right here, can you see that's the optimum point. The optimum point is you get uh, you get 100% lumens when you run the fixture at 100% rated of its voltage. That's what you're going to do, right? So if the voltage is rated for 120, Karen, we're going to give it 120. You don't give it to 240 because you will burn it. If you don't give it to uh, 170 because it will, you will reduce its life. So, and this is the formula that you can uh, use to predict uh, what's going to happen to the voltage, what's going to happen to the lumens if the voltage goes up, and what's going to happen to the life if the, goes, if the voltage goes up. So long story short, 
ladies and gentlemen, you increase the voltage, you get more lumens, but at the same time, you reduce the life expectancy of that of that lamp. So um, be aware of that. Ultimately, here's different shapes um, that you guys can use. Look at these. If it's an A shape, look how an A shape, A19, guys. The number next to them, um, so let's go to R. Here's an R shape by manufacturer. An R52, guys, means the diameter here is actually 52 divided by 8. Okay? The number next to them, guys, will indicate the diameter of that fixture. The letter will indicate the type, right? Different type. Why would they go, I mean, to, into that detail to distinguish them? Very important, guys. They have to distinguish them by voltage, by shape, for application. So if you have a machine or a fixture that takes C7, do you want to go with, really, with, with a, a PAR-38 fit into it? It might, you might be able to screw it in, but it, it sticks, you know. So there's a lot of fixtures that need certain lamps. So the smarter than Chad decided, let's go R, R look at this one. Um, an R40, look how big, fat, fluffy that guy. This is 40 divided by 8. That will give you 5 inches here. Um, right? They do it right? 5 inches diameter. Can you fit this one in a place where you need 2 inches here? Diameter? Does it make sense why the letters and the shapes and what's not? And I don't want to spend too much on them because, um, okay, here's, we talked about the diameter. You can see the number that you can put here is actually divided by eight. That will give you uh, the diameter. That will give you the diameter. Um, okay, we talked about this. Okay, let's go talk a little bit about the fluorescent guys, as long as we're on it. The fluorescent fixtures are very simple. Any comments, guys? Any questions about the incandescent fixtures before we move into the fluorescent fixtures? Any comments? Any questions? Any comments, guys? Any questions? Yes, sir. High temperature. Yep. High temperature. I think they, they use halogen too. The halogen lights. Yeah, they're very bright. Yep, absolutely. Very bright. Yeah. And they are very, I don't know, they are, I don't know how they allow it. I don't know how they allow them. They, they will blind you. Absolutely. Right. Okay. And the incandescent lamps, that's guys, one day we, we probably will be talking about the, I mean, the fluorescent lamps, like we talked about the incandescent means gone. The way it's, it's made, guys, they, they, the cathodes, they have cathodes in both ends here. These are the source of the ignition. They call them a source of ignition. So Adam, my friend, what they do is they bring the power into these cathodes and they heat them. When they heat them, they start shooting electrons. When they start shooting electrons, they create an arc. They create an arc inside this bulb. That bulb contained the arc, and at the same time, what the smarter than chat said, since this is a UV um, type of light, which we can't see UV, ultraviolet, we can't see it. So they put phosphorus, they painted it with phosphorus, uh, or, you know, put phosphorus on it, and that phosphorus will convert it into visible light. Who cares? It is much efficient than the incandescent lights. That's why we all love the fluorescent lights so far. And what they do, guys, is through a couple of mercury that drives my wife nuts, right? That little spots of mercury here um, place into the bulb to furnish the mercury vapor. Some mercury vapor, it makes, the, it makes the arc better, it makes the arc work, and what's not. That's basically it. Of course, you need a base here so you can connect to the power from both ends, right? You connect to the 120. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, lead wires. Can you guys see the lead wires so you connect to the power from, from in? Uh, the stem so you can hold the heater, the uh, cathode. Um, they have some exhaust tube here. What they do is they exhaust the air out of it, out of that uh, tube, and they put um, gases here inside it. Uh, and these gases are in, in what do you call them? Inert gases. They are, um, and they inject them light into the uh, that bulb, guys, in order to make the performance of the arc much much better than if it was just the um, um, just the air. 
So that's basically what the function of that one. You need the bulk force to contain the whole arc, right? So base, what else? And for lead wires, we talked about the lead wires. They stem to hold the cathode. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Very simple, little cathode um, and at the end. And your cathode is nothing other than a little heater almost. And uh, this will emit when you heat that little baby, it will, it's made out of the same thing, coiled tungsten. It's like the, the incandescent lamps almost. The heat it and start shooting electrons. You shoot the electrons, it interacts with the gases here, create an arc. The arc will be converted, gentlemen, into visible light so you and I can see. Any comments, guys, about the work of that lamp? Not really nothing rocket science into it. So that's my lamp. Um, in terms of um, the stems, they guys come, we'll talk about stems. They come in different types and different stems and what's not. Um, single pen, you can have them in single pen or bi pins. Um, as you connect them, single pins or bi pins. And so um, the designation T6, when you say T6 or T8, for example, that T8 is 8 divided by 8, and that will give you one inch. That will be the diameter of the the diameter of that bulb. So when they say T8, it's that big. If it's T5, it's smaller. Okay. So that will tell you if you're looking in the field. And the electrician said, "Did you guys put T5 there? Yup, we put T5. You look at it there. You should recognize it's, it should be smaller, right? Just by looking at it." without reading even that. Does that make sense? So it's like uh, the difference between EMT and rigid. Can you, did you guys put rigid there? Yep, we put rigid. Can you distinguish that this is not rigid? So a lot of people do if you see it more often. Okay, um, and different type of bases that you can connect them to the power. We'll talk about this one in a second. Different type of shapes, guys. Here's your T8, the most common ones, um, your T8. These two types, T8, T12, they don't make them a lot any, anymore. These are all type T12. Um, different shapes you can see. You can uh, plug them in. Look at the designation PLC lamp, SL lamp, uh, PL lamp, four pin lamp for different application, round one, um, T9, circle, and what's not. Any comments, guys, about the designation? The most common ones that you probably would be using, using T8. Uh, slim pen T8 or 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 medium pen T8. That's the most common one. And T5. I don't have T5 here. Any comments, guys? Every time you see T, you talk about tube, tube, tubular, tubular, meaning it's round tube, right? Either in straight or looped. U U stands for the U, the loop in the shape of a U. Uh, circle. Look at that circle or something. They can make the U. The tube circle and what's not. So these are your different type of fluorescent lights. How does it work? Uh, Adam, what they do is they heat the cathode here, and the cathode starts shooting electrons, and the electrons will uh, bounce off the um, create the arc by bouncing off the gases in here. And when the arc started as a UV arc, the phosphorus UV arc radiation, right? The phosphorus will convert it into the visible spectrum, and you get yourself beautiful light that you can do your work underneath. Any comments, any questions? So heat the, the cathode, shoot a couple of electrons, bounce off the gases inside, um, inside the bulb, create the arc, and you got yourself a um, uh, lighting fixture. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about these um, shows you and then we'll go into the ballast guys uh, let me see okay um, talked about the low voltage here fluorescent luminary use we said it's the most common one after the LEDs now energy saving due to the high efficacy they are oops they're very high efficacy that's why we we said we use them uh, unless you move into the fluorescent uh, the um, LEDs so high efficacy, very big deal, and energy saving. That's we love it. We talked about the construction, guys. You have a glass tube inside it, uh, an electrode, and you have a base at each end so you can connect it. So not rocket science to it. It is called electrical discharge light, guys. There is an arc. You're creating an, uh, the light through an arc. Your light is created through an arc. 
construction. You saw this construction tube is coated with phosphorus. Then they put the phosphorus inside the tube to convert the ultraviolet into visible light. Uh, air is evacuated, and they put uh, a gas inside it, guys. Um, an air enriched gas uh, plus a small quantity of mercury. That's when you bounce off this mercury and the gas, you get to the arc. And um, to, so it's almost that lighting bulb, guys, is almost a machine, you, you, a piece of equipment. You manipulate what's inside it to maintain the R chemically, all right? You're putting chemicals inside that thing to make it perform different type of um, arc or different type of color or what's not. Um, characteristics, we talked about the types, guys, the T types and the length, typically eight foot, I mean, uh, uh, four feet lamps, but you can get them in others. Watts, 32, watts are the most common right now, 40 watts and what's not. And shapes, they can come from a straight to round to screw in and, and what's not. Any comments, guys, about the fluorescent? Any comments, any questions about the fluorescents? So these are your fluorescents. We talked about this one, how it works, very simple. Um, uh, catalog designation and color. Um, the most important thing, guys, for them is um, they have different colors, the, the Kelvin. The higher the Kelvin, I, I want to emphasize this one because we guys use it all the time. The higher the Kelvin, the K value, the Kelvin value, the whiter, cooler the light output, okay? So when you say 5,000 Kelvin, Adam, they say, what type of fixture at Michelle Pool are we going to specify? We're going to specify, you see in the respect, say 5,000 Kelvin. A 5,000 Kelvin will give you a cooler, whiter color. A warmer, warm white, cool white will look more bluish, guys. Warm white will look, anybody? Reddish. You know, warm white will look more reddish. Um, and the Kelvin will be low, well, the Kelvin will be higher. And of course, all this have to meet the EPA, all of these guys, because he has chemicals, have to meet the EPA requirement. Rating indicates lamp has passed the EPA test. We have chemicals inside them, so they have to pay, like everything else, the tox toxicity characteristic leading procedures or what's not. So they have to have the EPA uh, um, approval. Operation, inside the lamp is coated with a phosphorus material. You, you heat that little cathode, you create an arc uh, through the pumping the voltage high, guys. And you maintain the arc by the ballast will maintain the current down so the circuit breaker does not trip. Um, sufficient fulgent is applied to the electrodes. You put the voltage high. Electrons strike the mercury atoms. That's where the whole all hell break loose here. When you create an arc, you release these nasty electrons atom, and they hit the atoms of the mercury. And what happened? After that, you got yourself radiation. That's scary, right? Radiation emitted atoms. And what do you do with the radiation? In order to convert it into visible light, you put it through the phosphorus coating inside the tube. Simple as that one. Create an, an electrons, release them in that tube. It hits the, strikes the mercury atoms that you, the little atoms that you put of mercury inside. Um, create the radiation. That's your arc in form of radiation. Um, Phosphorus will convert the ultraviolet light into visible light. We talked about that. Um, retrofitting existing installation, carrying almost light, constantly changing, and they're getting it to a store like um, Target, guys, and re retrofitting everything into um, more efficient fluorescent lights or LEDs now, right? Uh, the, whole, the whole LEDs. So the first thing they do, electronic ballast. If you have electromagnetic ballast, which is a coil, now you can't almost find an electromagnetic ballast in the, in the commercial building for fluorescent. You can't find it. It's almost all electronic right now. Um, older electromagnetic ballast replaced with electronic because they're more efficient. Um, they have to have high intensity discharge lamps required for high intensity discharge lamps. Also, the high the ballast you need the ballast if you have high intensity discharge lamps like uh, um, high pressure sodium and what's not uh, voltage to start. So, what does the ballast do? Look what the ballast do, guys. Voltage to start and control the current. That's, if anybody ever tell you what the heck is a ballast doing for any fixture. It pumps the voltage to start or, or manipulate the voltage to start the arc and controls the current to maintain the arc. That's it. 
Start the art, maintain the art. Done by the ballast. Any comments, guys? Any questions, gentlemen? Comments, questions? So that's your um, the job of your your uh, your ballast. There are different type of ballast. Reheat ballast. The way they used to do them, guys, they have a little starter. The starter closes. You heat the ballast. Do you guys anybody remember when they used flick, flicker, 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 flicker for a couple of seconds, and then flicker, 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 and then the light will come on? Do you remember these? They still have them even to this day with little starters in residential, not in a commercial. Flicker, flicker a little bit. That's the the preheat start. They're waiting for that little anode to heat up so they can start the shooting of the electrons. Kiss this one goodbye. Not done anymore in terms of the industry. Then they have trigger start. They use them in, in little smaller fluorescent lights that they use for tables. Almost the same concept. You push it, flicker a little bit um, to start. Rapid start. <coughs> <coughs> An instant start <coughs> are the most common. Instant start, guys, they apply the voltage right across the, <coughs> the lamp. <coughs> and they basically pump the voltage so high that the lamp will instantly start. Rapid start, Adam, they have a little control voltage that heats these from the ballast. Get, he keeps it ready, so when you want to call up on it, it it, it, it gives you <coughs> start. So the most common now is instant start. So when you turn the light on, the ballast is instant start. You don't instantly it comes. A lot of us guys don't notice that, but instant start. Uh, rapid start is also used, but if you don't know anything, instant start. Meaning it will be you. It heats it, shoots it, um, and start instantly. There's also program start. They start manipulating the frequency that they run these ballasts on, um, different frequencies. There's dimming ballast. They can also reduce, they maintain the voltage across the lamp, the same voltage, and manipulate the current, guys, to dim the, to dim the light. Voltage stays 120. Reduce the current from 1 amp into uh, 30, uh, 1 amp into, say, half an amp and what's not. <coughs> that will give you different, um, different lights. There's flashing circuits and high frequency circuits. They start changing the frequency, guys, that they create the arc web to get it. Or you can put a DC into the arc. So without getting into all the <coughs> so the arc, the way you create and maintain the arc become a science almost by itself. Either instantly preheat and trigger, guys, is not a whole a lot. Uh, a rapid start and instant start. Um, are the most common high frequency circuits they put high frequency into the ballast they make it more efficient to start and maintain the arc any comments guys about the ballast for the most part any comments any questions about the ballast there's also a class b a p ballast these are will be protecting believe it or not um the ballast guys are the heat they heat up they become hot and they create fire so they have a class P ballast that's protected. They have an over uh, overload protection and that protect them from heat or heat protection. The class class P ballast. Also, sound rating. Have you ever guys sat under a, a lighting fixture, Adam, and it, it it vibrates and makes noises, right? They give them a rating, believe it or not, from A through D. Anybody guess which one is the most quiet? The D or the A? If you have to guess, quiet to very noisy. A. A is very quiet, D is very noisy. They give him rating. So when you buy a ballast, of course, you want it to be A. A ballast means very quiet, doesn't do a whole lot. And the power factor, to meet the energy goals, you, you barely can, can find anything that does not have a 90 plus power factor. So all the ballasts that you buy, electronic ballasts, they have to maintain a power factor of 90. In the past, Adam, they, you put a capacitor to create a power factor for them. With the electromagnetic ballast because the electromagnetic ballast was uh, screwing up the power factor so we used to install little capacitor with every fixture so that's my um okay let me show you a couple of uh um wiring guys for this boy so we talked about these here's the ballast different type of ballast different type of connection you can see here the different type of uh, rating on these ballasts. Um, 
We hardly can see it. Here, look at the voltage, for example. You can bring to it 120 to 277. Any voltage between 120 and 277, bring it on. Um, that's about it, though, in terms of voltage. Um, here's the here's how they used to do it. This is the preheat wiring circuit, Adam. So if you want to, if you see it at home and you want to do it, so that starter will close, bring the voltage to the. Uh, um, cathodes here, create the arc, after it creates the arc, it opens the circuit, and the arc will be maintained by the ballast. That's called the preheat. Then this is the rapid start. That's how they do the rapid start. They bring a voltage, guys, a different voltage from the ballast directly into the lights to heat the, um, the uh, electrodes to create the... It's all about heating the electrodes, guys. It's all about heating the electrodes. Without heating the electrodes, you wouldn't get... Um, you would not get an arc. So that's your wiring uh, for a preheat. And the rapid start, look at the rapid start. This is your, uh, I'm sorry, instant start. The first one is rapid start. This is how your rapid start is wired. Your instant start, you look at this. They bring the voltage, the 120, right across the lamps and shock that lamp to start. It, and it all has to do, guys, with efficiency and you know it's really nice when you flip the switch all the light instantly comes on instead of sit and flicker 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 well these are all improvement in the the way a fluorescent light will work so that's what you're going to be doing these are the bases that comes with it um some of the fixtures guys what they do is they have uh <coughs> inline fuses so what they do here's my fixtures coming in here these are all fixtures, guys, wired to this bright circuit, Anna. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight fixtures wired in a bright circuit. Now, what happens if there is a short circuit in this fixture? Do you really want all the fixtures to trip? This is my 20 amp circuit. You can. The code allows you to do that. You lost the whole circuit. In the parking lot, they use this a lot. What they do, guys, is they use inline fuse. They call them inline fuse. So if there's a short circuit or ground fault in, in this typically ground fault, if there's a ground fault in this fixture, one, the inline fuse will open and that fixture only is the fixture that's going to trip or, or open. Every other fixture will continue to work. So you know that there's an inline fuse, go change it. Does that make sense? So that's, they use them again in the parking lot because if you have a ground fault in a, in a circuit, do you want to take the whole parking lot down? It's not a good idea, right? So they use inline fuses, they call them. How do they look like? Look at them here, very easy. Here's where fuse sits down, guys. You bring your circuit, you bring your hot in, and you take your hot out. You interrupt the hot. Inline fuses, very common again, Adam, when it comes to parking lot, especially parking lot. It's not coming indoor, but though you can use them here. Inline fuses. Um, Compact fluorescent, we'll talk about this one. Any question, guys, about the wiring before we go into the compact fluorescent? So there's nothing. Um, so the next one is, guys, is compact fluorescent lamps. Now they're taking over the incandescent lamps. I changed my house, to, two homes I moved in years ago, changed every single bulb into compact fluorescent. Now I'm at a point we're changing to LED, so I'm going to go to the next step. I wasn't too impressed about the compact fluorescent, Karen. I lost a few of them over the years. I really was not personally impressed. Um, they save money, though. They have the compact fluorescent. You guys are familiar with them, these blue, blue bulby thing. Um, what they do is why do why they become so popular? Because, because they can replace the incandescent lamps easily in residential. In residential. They have 10 times output. Uh, rated life is longer. I doubt that one. That of incandescent lamps, three times. So um, life is ten times longer. Uh, three to four times output of light. So it saves a lot of energy for you for the same lumen. Uh, twin tube arrangement. You can get them in single or twin tube arrangement. Twisted spiral tube. You've seen them. Configuration and class E. Uh, ballast class E ballast guys that they come with them whenever you see an E energy saving this means it passed regulation to to meet EPA energy regulation so it has an E energy rated basically so they have a ballast all the ballasts are energy rated okay so these are these are my compact fluorescent any comments guys about the compact fluorescent compact fluorescent we use them in the residential in the, in the commercial too for spotlights 
in a commercial building, if they want a spotlight area, your two options are either LEDs or compact fluorescent or some type of uh, compact fluorescent. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, questions? So retrofit to get rid of the incandescent. The last type, guys, is called high intensity discharge. The high intensity discharge is also an arc fixture. It is an arc fixture. Again, it's an arc tube. You have an arc to create the tube that's enclosed in an outer glow. They have a different, so create an arc. <coughs> 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 If you have mercury inside that tube, guys, <coughs> it becomes mercury vapor lamp, and they don't use them anymore. Why? Because of environmental reasons. Mercury is not good. Lowest efficacy of all the the lowest efficacy of all high intensity discharge, long life, um, not efficient. They have a lot of. Uh, if you see mercury, guys. Um, Mercury lamps, you, you go with, uh, with etch metal halide, they go with the designation M, high pressure sodium, um, L or C, high pressure sodium, L or C, L or C. These are the designation that they give. So metal, uh, um, high, I thought etch goes with the uh, high pressure sodium. Hmm, interesting. Um, so designation metal halide, or high pressure sodium, metal halide or high. Typically, metal halide or high pressure sodium is what you, what you use. Okay, metal halide. Uh, then metal halide is guys the, the the one that we use in our parking lots. You remember, relatively short life, um, rapid drop off light after it ages. This is a disadvantage. All the way to high pressure sodium. Your high pressure sodium life rating. Is better, so it's better performance, better life, uh, life, and uh, uh, better color rendering in this. And I'm going to take you guys into a table that compare all of them together. Low pressure sodium is the highest efficacy of all of them, but there is one little problem, Karen. You shall not be able to see your blue car from your green car underneath this uh, um, this table. This table, it's yellow. It only produces yellow. So all these guys are different types of fixtures. Uh, different type of lamps based on the chemical that they put inside them. Ballast for high intensity discharge lamps, you can put ballast for uh, for very high guys, metal halide, luminaires use an all 150 uh, watt all the way to 500 watts. So there's a, you have to have put ballast on all ballasted them, um, ballast each and every one of them. Okay. Then energy savings, there's the, uh, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 guys. Because of all of that, all your equipment have to be on your lights. Since the building energy stands for lighting, building power allowances. That's what we're going to be doing. Uh, come check. Um, come check. My friend, if I spelled it right. Come check. We're going to be using it to meet the energy code. That tells you you can't install a lighting fixture that doesn't meet the energy code. You also have to have an energy saving ballast because of the energy act uh, atom. And the energy saving ballast have to get you 90% power factor. If you meet or exceed the federal standards, they give you a letter E. This means your, your ballast for the ballast meets or exceeds the energy standards. Um, okay, so that's because of all of this one, guys. Energy, energy saving energy use up to 80. Okay. Improvement in the left of pass. So all these guys to change. And the last one. So that's it. We'll show you a couple of other examples about them. Energy code, come check. We're going to be using it. And of course, the top notch right now is what? LEDs. LEDs, guys, tiny little devices. You put a DC voltage across them and they illuminate very efficient. The, 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 the efficacy is very, very high. You're going to see uh, taking over everything. Um, no vibration. Lumen output slowly decline over time, but maintains it for a longer time um leds okay hazards and the last thing is when you recycle all these uh, high because of epa requirement when you recycle uh, anything to do with lambs or ballast of course you have to recycle in the proper way okay uh, older palace and what's not 
I want to show you, and that's basically it in terms, I'm just going to go back into my pictures and show if I see, um, there's one com one table I would like you guys to focus on in particular. Um, so we talked about these, here's a, a compact floor sun guys, different types, different shapes, um, uh, different designation. <laughs> For the lamps, um, LEDs, the energy. Okay, so here's what I would like you guys. I would like you guys to pay attention to this little table. You have it. This compare. That's a, I think it's one of the best. It compares all the types of lights with each other. For example, Adam, if you take the lumen per watt, that's the efficacy, you can see that low pressure sodium is the most efficient fixture. Can you guys see that? It gives you 100, up to 180 lumens per watt. There's one little problem with low pressure sodium. It does not distinguish between colors. It's a yellow. Everything looks yellow. Then the second one is high pressure sodium, guys. Look at that, 140. Um, high pressure sodium is good um, in terms of efficacy. Metal halide is also good. Mercury, we can't use it. A fluorescent is also good. Incandescent is the worst. Can you guys see how we're getting rid of the incandescent because the worst? V watt range. Can you guys see the watt ranges that you can get each and every one of them with? Uh, life expectancy. You can see the uh, fluorescent go to 20,000 hours, convert to 8,000 hours almost for uh, filament or incandescent. Um, 24,000 hours for high pressure sodium or 20,000 uh, for male halide. Uh, color temperature, you can see that color temperature you can buy any one of them. Color rendering index, look at uh, uh, fluorescent, you can get them really with good color rendering index. Metal halide and high pressure sodium are really bad. Low pressure sodium zero. Can you guys see the color rendering index zero for low pressure sodium? High pressure sodium and metal halide are good, um, and could especially metal halide for color rendering index. Potential for good uh, good uh, color rendering index index treatment. High pressure sodium, yep, you can treat it to get a better color rendering index. Lamp cost, low, immediate, so all this good stuff. Cost of operation, how much would it cost you to operate? Based on all of this. Karen, based on all of this, here's what your two options, unless you go to LEDs. Option number one, if you're indoor, guys, in indoor, you're looking at this. And option number two, <coughs> if you're outdoor, outdoor, you're looking at this. Did you guys hear me? Because of all this comparing, all things considered, operation, cost, uh, um, Lumen, output, efficiency, and what's not, unless you use LEDs, you're looking at these two options. Sometimes the metal high pressure sodium also is another option. <coughs> also outdoor. Low pressure sodium, typically for highways and what's not, I think they use them. They, if, if, you're, if you're on a highway, do you really, and driving, do you really want to know what color is this unless you're a cop? You just need to know that there is an object in the front of you and see it clearly. So you're not writing an essay about how it looks like the color of the object. Okay. Any comments, guys, any questions? Based on this, comparing all of this, you got exactly what you got with me, guys, what we did in the project. Fluorescent inside, metal hairline outside. Now, jump to the LEDs right underneath them. Now, when you go to the LEDs, Almost everything, indoor, outdoor, become LEDs, really, in these days. Um, like next project that we're going to be doing. LEDs have a lot of uh, potential, guys. Um, have drawback, of course, expensive, but they're getting down, getting low on the, on the price too. <coughs> so lumens per watt, it says 29 to 100, so it can get you compact fluorescent. They're comparing the compact fluorescent here. Compact fluorescent is only for spotlight, not, not typically general lighting. So long story short, my friend, um, your LED will be taking over the ranges. Um, and all these even obsolete, probably as we thought, temperature that you can get. <coughs> <coughs> Color rendering index. So, um, 
all things considered, when you compare all these guys together uh, with the energy saving and with the energy code <coughs> requirement, <coughs> you're almost getting into LEDs indoor, at least indoor and outdoor. Any comments, gentlemen and ladies, any questions? Any comments, any questions? I can't emphasize, guys, these table that compare between all these types of fixtures. It's really nice to, yeah, to put them all in one, uh, one, diff one, uh, one place and compare them all together. Any comments, guys? So after all this yakking, we end up with the same thing. Now fluorescent inside, high intensity discharge metal head outside, or LEDs all over. <clears throat> Next project, we will be doing LEDs all over, like I mentioned a couple of times. One more time. Any comments, guys? Any questions about this? Comments, questions? Brian? So that's it for, for now, guys. Next uh, next chapter, we'll be talking about fixtures. Again, we talked about lights a lot. Hopefully, guys, you're going to, by the, by the time you finish with this, you're going to be sick of lights. That's the whole idea, is lights are a major part, guys. 30% of what, what our consumption in any building, almost lights, lighting load. You're going to be encountering, <coughs> we brought experts here that talk about lights, all what they do, day in, day out is just light. Still light. So it's a major part of the electrical industry, major part. Okay, that's all what I have for you. Thank you.